Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much, uh, Jerome and colleagues, for the opportunity to talk today. Let me share my screen and then I will start my presentation. Oh, sorry. Not this one, but this one. Okay, share here. Okay. Tell me if you can see it. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Good. So um, today my topic is going to be about healthcare information security and privacy. That uh, is a topic that combines two of my say uh, working life experience. That is a cybersecurity, where I've been from 2000 to 2010, and life science, where I'm uh, since uh, 2013. So combining these two expertise, uh, and uh, I have to say that one of my two passions, um, I've, uh, um, I've made this, uh, uh, this uh, presentation focusing on some aspect that has a target to give you an idea of the complexity in this area, as I think it's very, very important that uh, the awareness to everyone using digital tools, but also being a patient or being a project manager or anyway involved in the research is able to, to have an um, overall understanding of uh, uh, how the security and privacy uh, is impacting uh, what you are doing. So this is the uh, agenda of uh, today. Uh, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the uh, some, some data, uh, then we'll go through cybersecurity in Europe healthcare, then we'll talk about legislation, then cybersecurity in medical devices, cloud integration, what are the recommendations for European agency for cybersecurity, because there is a matter of compliance that we need to, to consider. I will make a couple of examples. So the OWASP and, and Bounty, and I will talk about uh, the factors that can be contribute to cybersecurity risk in the medical device sector. Uh, we, I will make an example of an attack on implantable medical device, and also we'll talk about how the, the, the crowd could help in some bug funding, and then we'll have the session of uh, Q&A. So as we move the, the time, uh, sorry to ask this, uh, at what time I have to finish the presentation to start q and I think it's half an hour, correct? Up to 45 minutes, I think, sh should be okay. Yeah. Okay. So, if, okay. If I leave uh, 15 minutes for, okay. Anyway, no okay. more than 45 minutes. Perfect. Thank you. So, let's for, first of all start from this uh, interesting data that are uh, showing what are the reasons for data breach. And this is a re important report uh, created by Verizon. Verizon is an important telco operator in the US. And yearly, they make this report that is one of the say uh, most, most interesting uh, aspect to understand what are the trends because Verizon network is so big in US that they have a significant number of cases. Um, so first of all, physical action. It's not a lot, it's just 4%, but uh, we have to consider that uh, many times data breach are linked to uh, the fact that someone is stalling your computer, your smartphone, and through that is able to access data. So one important uh, element here is for sure the um, encryption of information or the fact that uh, uh, it's very important to uh, protect uh, uh, something from uh, uh, access of someone else. And so very simple uh, element uh, like tracing the laptop or computer location could be uh, useful to uh, access the, the device once stolen. Then we have unauthorized use. Uh, another aspect uh, that is uh, unfortunately very common is the use of a very simple password. And uh, uh, thanks to this, uh, the access to data and to information uh, from someone that could have the password uh, is, uh, is simple. Uh, let's consider that now more and more it's possible to access the system from remote, so to have a secure password or to close the remote access to the to a device or to a computer could be important because otherwise also working on a computer, we do have someone that get in. 
Then there are the pieces of software that create a problem. So uh, malware is uh, the fourth uh, reason for data breach uh, with 17%. And another aspect very important is the social engineering with 22%. Of course, this is not something that happened automatically, something managed by someone else that get into a system thanks to the uh, support of someone else. Like for example, in a big company, calling a user, telling that he's from the IT support, asking to uh, recreate a new password, telling let's try this password, change it, okay, does it work, okay. But at the same time, once you change it, the person who call you have it. And this is uh, happening a lot of times. One on five cases are, uh, linked to social engineering, but another more simple example with this is the phishing. It now is becoming very, very sophisticated. And uh, unfortunately, I have a lot of people uh, doing that, uh, uh, or, or better, uh, uh, being um, uh, someone attacked by this kind of uh, system, because basically, we have to consider that while physical action and unauthorized use are linked to activity by someone, malware is automatic and also uh, phishing is automatic. So that part of the social engineering could target billions of people that, uh, you know, because you have uh, email uh, maybe coming, they're taking them from uh, some breach in some uh, database. And so it, it's quite common. So. Phishing is a very, very uh, important aspect that is growing in terms of um, uh, risk. Then human error. Human error uh, also count uh, on a lot of uh, cases uh, and uh, it is uh, an important factor that will continue to exist because anyway, we're talking about complex system and uh, to have someone that make an error, forget uh, to configure in a proper way a router or a server or other machine is quite common. And I can tell you by my past experience in cybersecurity, where one of the products that we developed at that time was a tool to test the configuration of server that was at the moment uh, just managed by people, but not properly tested every time that someone was happening on that. If we think about the a clinical trial environment, for example, there, there is an approach that is following the so-called uh, um, good uh, clinical practices and that they are following the, the GAMP5 uh, um, uh, methodology that require a computer system validation. And in the computer system validation, you have all the procedures also to manage properly the change management of the server that are managing, for example, the data collection of patient like the ECRF or the, the, the document connect collection in ETMS and other tools. But it's not a common application, especially once we are in a research environment, um, you tend to skip, let's say, too much procedures because they are length and, and expensive and boring. And uh, it makes a system prone to be with some human error. Then the first thing, sir, of course, is criminal hacking. Uh, this is related to the highest number of uh, uh, situation. And uh, it is uh, present, it's continuing, and uh, it's done uh, in various ways, uh, also using techniques and technologies that uh, most of the people don't know at all in terms of existence, like, uh, for example, zero day exploit. So the fact that there are some vulnerabilities that are not yet known and that the people is using that vulnerabilities to get into the systems. Now there is a, a market, a worldwide market for this kind of vulnerabilities because there are institutions, government, but also other subjects that pay a lot of money to give an idea some years ago for a zero day uh, vulnerability on iPhone. There was people paying something like $1 million to have it because this gives the opportunity through the attacker to get into a system and to do basically whatever they want. 
But of course, uh, there are initiatives to, to contain this problem. And one of these uh, is linked to uh, the uh, activity that uh, European healthcare with other uh, subjects are, are going on. The problem uh, is that uh, in this situation where COVID-19 has created a significant digitalization of uh, the environment, uh, there are more systems, not uh, enough uh, structure online or connected to the online. And the rising cost of these uh, breaches are growing. Also because the numbers of attacks are growing. So the, we can say that cybersecurity is starting to become a sort of mission critical technology for uh, most industry in the, in the healthcare, talking about hospitals or uh, service providers, or uh, pharma companies or medical devices companies. So it's becoming really, really a problem. Um, also because many times there is a problem of a legacy software that uh, is about impossible from the cost point of view to, uh, to change or to, or to update because the, the time where a system, and we'll make an example later, um, is uh, inside a, a healthcare environment is not the system of upgrade of a normal Windows server or Windows client. And also the obsolescence of a computer or a normal computer is not the same of a healthcare machine. So there is a problem because uh, to substitute this system become uh, about impossible and then uh, you have to consider that potentially uh, impact on the um, continuous uh, delivery of the healthcare services uh, can be significant in terms of um, responsibility, uh, GDPR and so on. In terms of uh, costs, there are ransomware that are increasing in terms of uh, um, uh, situation and many times they are not uh, uh, public so a company pays and then uh, everything is closed um, so, uh, but one day you have to pay sometimes they have to pay hundreds of thousand or million of euro or dollars very quickly so there are some legislation that are helping on one side uh, to be compliant and uh, the fact that the legislation helped you to be compliant is linked to the fact that many of the organizations that manage healthcare data or healthcare services are obliged to uh, follow very strictly the legislation, also because many times they are uh, public institutions. And uh, so this is a way to, to, re to reach a certain level of security or to uh, ask uh, institution to do some uh, some activity. So first of all, there is a, a and here you will I will I mentioned the, the 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 title of this uh, legislation. Then if you want, you can go in looking through Google to to have a, a specific uh, uh, document. So there is a directive on the application of patients' rights in cross-border healthcare. This is something growing. Uh, cross-border now is more and more common because uh, infrastructure are scattered through Europe or uh, around the world. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's important to distinguish among data that remain inside European Union or data that go outside of European Union. But with tools uh, uh, that are supporting also some decision making or diagnosis that are based on AI, um, and uh, other uh, complex technologies like, for example, modeling and simulation, the opportunity that some data goes outside of a country or outside of a continent to be analyzed is uh, uh, becoming more and more frequent. Then we have the GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation that is asking a lot of things to um, users. And then we have others that probably uh, many of you have never heard of, like AIDAS regulation, 
NIS directive. NIS uh, is a uh, one of the directive from ENISA, the, who is the European uh, uh, Cybersecurity Initiative. Uh, then there is the EU Cybersecurity Act uh, that is also asking to uh, medical device producer, both in terms of hardware with software or software developer, to uh, consider a lot of aspect. And also the MDR regulation on medical devices is going to be applied from uh, next uh, May. Um, is referring to some characteristics of the software part of medical devices in terms of cybersecurity. So the problem is that once you're developing something that manage uh, patient data, you need to be compliant with all of them at the same time. You can say, I want to be compliant just to one of these. And here we're talking about Europe. If you move outside Europe and uh, we go to, to US, then we have other things. So it's a very, very complex aspect that uh, it's not possible to say, well, it's a matter of uh, that technical guy because it's uh, something so important that uh, um, have to be considered as one of the fundamental piece of everything we are doing in a software space, everything. And from the beginning, so it's important to have an understanding of uh, at least uh, the common rules of these uh, uh, legislations and uh, to build something on top of this basis. Because otherwise, if you build something and then you try to be compliant, then it could be too late or it could be too expensive to become compliant. So an example uh, of uh, where uh, there are these needs. One is the connected devices. So more and more uh, projects, but now also deliveries uh, of, of technologies are linked to the IoT. So to component and devices that uh, the patient has with him or her and then transmit data somewhere. But there are risks risk connected to this. And uh, for example, we could have a risk in terms of uh, efficiency because once the IoT is helping the patient uh, in its own therapy or uh, to be alive, could be like a pacemaker, for example, con a connected pacemaker or a connected insulin pump, you don't have hours or, or, or days to manage it. You could have problem that you need to solve in terms of minutes, um, if not less in terms of uh, operation. And uh, of course, this could become a target of uh, cyber terrorists. Some years ago, vice president from US has been quickly um, took under Sergion because he had a pacemaker and this, that pacemaker was uh, potentially a target of a cybersecurity attack. And uh, so you've been through uh, surgery to remove it. But let's imagine if uh, a group of 100, 1000 of devices that are connected and they are safe because of a new vulnerability discovered, become unsafe from that moment on. You start to have a big problem because you can say, okay, don't use the car because it's dangerous. Because these are pieces that maybe, as I said before, could keep the person alive. So that would be a problem. So what is the challenge there? First of all, to keep the network safe, uh, to consider that uh, uh, you need to engineer a solution that if it's going to last for a lot of times, so you have to potentially replace legacy system. And also uh, you have to uh, manage in a very um, good uh, govern way, the connection among different medical devices, because otherwise this could become a mess. So you could have a piece that is safe, 
that is connected to another piece that is absolutely unsafe and uh, that could be the problem for the rest of the network. Unfortunately, there is a low maturity on cybersecurity. Uh, probably if I say now terms like uh, uh, WAF, so uh, um, Web Application Firewall or Buffer Overflow, I don't think that many of you are able to understand what is the, the meaning of this. But it's not a matter of expertise. This become a matter of uh, um, familiarity with the, this, this environment, because we have to consider the cybersecurity in the future will have to be something like uh, English is now uh, for people. So you can't work in this field if you don't speak English uh, uh, over a central level, better than a central level. In the future, we have to consider that we will not be able to work on uh, computer stuff if you do not govern cybersecurity aspect in a certain way. It is exactly the same things happening once you're driving a car. So once you're driving a car, you have a lot of tests that are targeting the fact that uh, you know what are the security measures. Otherwise, you cannot drive it. But now everyone can use a computer, everyone can use a, a smartphone. And uh, so the question is, uh, how long are we going to let people use these kind of tools without the proper awareness? That's one of the questions. Hospitals, unfortunately, are easy targets. Uh, in my past experience, we will run a lot of uh, penetration tests uh, to hospitals. And I would say that, unfortunately, the situation there is really, really complex because they are very complex system with a lot of needs of uh, connection and uh, uh, they are, as we have seen for me, uh, attacks so far linked to um, the ransomware uh, uh, are an easy target. Uh, luckily, they have not yet been target of a, a terrorist attack that could be, be also uh, worse because uh, let's imagine that someone get into a hospital and change completely the database of prescription and you start to give uh, a pill to someone and this pill is going to kill him or her and vice versa you don't give to the people that need a specific pill the right pill it could take if you have everything on a, a database sometimes to uh, set up correctly the system but in the meantime you will have some people dying because you don't know what to give to, uh, to the person. And the problem is also the lack of security awareness. I was saying, I was talking about before. <clears throat> so physician, administrative personnel and patient, uh, many times uh, they can use their own <clears throat> personal devices connected to network. Um, and uh, unfortunately there are some cases where this is not uh, correctly managed in terms of configuration, in terms of features. So this is a, a need because everyone wants to be connected but on the other side there is a problem i can tell you that in in the clinical trial world is covid 19 there there are there are situations where they've started to um, expose uh, personal data through web conference like this uh, to make the uh, monitoring visit on uh, the clinical trials so using Zoom or WebEx and showing the papers uh, through, uh, through the internet without any kind of uh, guarantee that you cannot copy the data, you, no one is, is listening. So it's a very, very dangerous uh, situation that um, is uh, linked to the fact that there is a shift from what is possible from the cons consumer point of view to the let's say, industry or hospital uh, environment where there are different uh, needs and different uh, um, uh, aspects to be considered. <clears throat> Another element is the service security and medical devices. We were referring to that uh, some minutes ago because the lifespan of medical devices, such as CT scanner or MRI machine, usually they are quite long. 
and they can also be longer than how the manufacturer what the manufacturer has anticipated for very simple budget reason so once you are spending uh one million for uh or a million and a half for a five tesla mri system uh you you try to use it as much as possible but if there are components in this system that are linked to some commercial software that uh, become obsolete then uh, it's a problem so sometimes uh you could have uh, an issue linked to the fact that you need to put updates security updates on the system they are done by third party and this also is creating some some, some issue in terms of governance but also uh you could have uh, some problem uh in the patching or remote patching and updating of the firmware itself because if this process is not done in the proper way uh, this could create uh, some loopholes some uh, some backdoor some 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 issue uh, in the specific system. Here, uh, there is a lot of text because uh, I decided to took this uh, uh, this phrase from uh, ENISA, that is the European initiative I was mentioned before about cybersecurity. And uh, uh, this is what they say about uh, cloud security for healthcare services. So uh, the, here, uh this part is related to cloud integration and i decided to, to put it this because cloud is a, a very attractive environment a lot of things are moving to the cloud i can tell you that once something is, is secure in the cloud is highly secure and more secure than something in your internal network because uh, uh, the capacity to do that is higher um linked to the fact that the people managing the cloud uh, uh is doing that for a lot of companies instead of the internal network but uh this is a uh, um something that uh is complex uh there are hacker organizations that are hesitating to adopt the cloud because there is a very dense and complex uh, legal basis and also um they are scared of uh, loss of uh, data governance and uh, we could have some some question on that so if we put uh, the, the data in a cloud uh, that is uh, a us cloud how much are we going to have a, a governance on that data considering that by the us law uh, us uh, uh, governative agency are able to access everything whenever they want so this is a uh, this is a point um, on the other side, there are some uh, so-called government cloud, and there are uh, experiences in, in Europe like Gaia, for example, Gaia X, for example, and others that are creating this uh, um, country cloud or at least European cloud that target uh, a better governance uh, of information. So, what are the uh, recommendations? from the agency for to improve the service security. So first of all, to ensure business continuity. So uh, making effective backup and restore procedures. I think that no one here has ever done a restore activity as a test. Maybe I'm wrong, but usually it's like that. And also uh, to define a business continuity plan and also in this case there are a lot of initiative but very very few are really uh experiencing this uh, kind of environment and uh, um so the, the problem is that once it's really needed to uh switch on the other system will not be so easy uh but of course uh, if you do that if you make your plan and if you define very well the role of internal people but also all the different suppliers then you are and you make some tests for it then you are in line to ensure this business continuity that is very important it's easy if you are a little company you become very complex if you are a big organization then uh, there is a problem once uh, you have some incident impacting a medical device and uh, the 
recommendation they give is to coordinate everything with the device manufacturer because it's very important that uh, the people that have the specific knowledge is able to support the incident. And then there is a network segmentation. Uh, that is another important aspect in terms of uh, uh, closing the network traffic through areas to avoid that there is a, a spill of, of um, some malicious content from one area to the other. And this is also very, very important, especially uh, in uh, uh, hospitals or in area where you're storing data for important research. Or we were, we were very aware of the fact that uh, there was attack on the EMA system to get data linked to the Pfizer uh, research. And in general, um, if uh, uh, an hacker could get into a database where he's able to get all the phase three data of a trial or to get the data in terms of uh, uh, how to build a specific drug before it's patented, uh, the value could be really incredible. Um, then uh, uh, it's important to share information with other staff in the organization. So once there is an incident, uh, you need to know who you have to, to call. And also this aspect is not so clear because there is not enough awareness. So probably you don't have a number uh, to call for uh, this uh, uh, specific point uh, if you are in a crisis situation. Uh, and uh, very simple, uh, if you think that uh, you are in a situation where the system is infected, it's better to ask the staff to disconnect from the network and uh, contain the, the, the the spread of, of the problem. Uh, the, if there is a system compromise, first of all, freeze any activity in the system, disconnect the infected machine, go offline from the network and contact the security and response team, the so-called uh, um, uh, uh, co control room uh, or, or a group uh, like uh, SOC, Security Operation Center, that are there ready to, to give response. Um, it's better to make this kind of uh, things uh, before, but also if you are working to develop a solution, these are very important aspect because if you are the one who's, who's engineering the solution, you need to think about how your solution will behave in a situation of uh, attack. And so if you can freeze the activity, disconnect the solution from the network, who you need to call, how you need to provide the information on uh, being um, involved in the incident and so on, so on. So don't have to look at that only as, as a healthcare hospital point of view, but you have to look at that also as a solution you are developing or a system of, for the research you are you're working on that could be a target of an attack. So how an attack would be deployed? And for example, in an implantable medical device. So we could have um, an, an attack on a two, uh, two aspects. Let's assume that this is a, a specific uh, um, device like uh, uh, an insulin pump, uh, implanted insulin pump, or um, uh, it's a pacemaker. So you have two kinds of, of problems. So the first one is the communication attack. And the second one is an attack on uh, the uh, specific device. So the communication attack is something that uh, block the interaction from the device towards uh, another system that uh, is used to provide to the device information or the need to receive information from the device to see what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. There are um, uh, various examples. I will just uh, uh, spend some time on this one. This is the night of service. So sometimes 
you could think that the attacker um, is something very sophisticated, but sometimes it's not, uh, because the simple way to put offline a system is to bombard it with information in a way that it's not able to manage them. So now you cannot do manually, but at the beginning, the web server was not able to manage hundreds of thousands of, of connections. So if you would open browser on different computer and start to connect, you would create what is called the denial of service. And so the system responding to you was not able to respond to the real user of that tool. And that uh, would become a problem. So once you have something that is uh, wireless, you need to consider that aspect and to see if there is a system that is able to avoid the denial of service. Uh, once you are on the internet, you have another problem in terms of denial of service, because, for example, uh, if you have a, a lot of uh, uh, input from uh, one uh, source, you can stop that source. But if you have a lot of sources, like 1,000 of computer that are connecting to the server to look for some information, you are not really able to uh, discriminate from computer that are doing that uh, properly or computer doing that for the denial of service. In this case, you are talking about a distributed denial of service attack. On the other side, you will have an internal attacks on the system and uh, you could have an attack on the calibration. So you could change parameters so you can create, uh, you can change the threshold where the device do something or no, or uh, you can attack uh, low in the battery. So maybe something active that uh, burn all the battery of the system or give information that the battery is low and so you rush into something without any need, or you can modify the data that uh, the system is generating or storing. I don't want to, to make uh, let's say a terroristic uh, <laughs> presentation, but unfortunately these are aspects that need to be taken into account for every solution you are developing if it has a value. Because if it has a value, then this could be target of something. Then uh, uh, let's talk about two aspects. The first one is uh, how the community from the technological point of view is giving response to this kind of needs and how the community is helping to solve the problem, some of the problem I just mentioned. So the first one is the OWASP. The OWASP is a very interesting uh, organization. It's a non-profit foundation. They want to improve the security of software where uh, OWASP stands for Open Web Application Security Project. And I'm going in, into the detail of OWASP in a moment. While the bug bounty program is also very, very interesting because uh, it's something that probably no one of you have heard because it's not so common, but it's a way where a uh, developer of a big website can uh, find someone who, who is testing them. Uh, because you expose your website and uh, you have people testing it before making the website become the real final solution that you start to market. But let's go, first of all, on the wall wasp. So these are the 10 web application security risks. Injection, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure, XML for external entities, uh, broken access control, security misconfiguration, cross-site scripting, insecure deserialization of the, of the software, or using components that have specific known vulnerabilities, or insufficient logging and monitoring that don't give you the opportunity to make an analysis of what's happening or what happened to identify problems. Um, if you go on, on the internet, you will find your this uh, OWASP top 10 vulnerability and you can find also an interesting guide that is telling you what are, uh, what are the tests that you need to do before releasing a software that is web-based. So it's quite useful and also simple to be followed. I was talking about bug crowd. This is a, a, a page from uh, the bugcrowd.com website. That is uh, one of the most common system. 
And uh, uh, this is what they are doing, of course, penetration testing, vulnerability disclosure, attack surface management, but also bug bounty. And uh, how this work? Basically, the researcher has a workbench where they are able to see the uh, website that is published. And uh, they are managed in the sense that uh, they are addressed to a specific uh, area or to a specific topic uh, for um, a specific test. Uh, there is an orchestration of this activity and then you get the results. What is interesting is that uh, these people making attacks are making attacks on something that is not yet um, a finalized uh, product, but is in the development phase or pre-release. And they are paid uh, by the number of vulnerability or the level of the vulnerability that they uh, find out. So once uh, this is uh, uh, developed by uh, the, um, the users, then uh, um, you can uh, really have uh, a strong support in terms of uh, uh, who is testing what and uh, uh, if your system is secure enough before going into the production phase because you will have uh, this, uh, this crowd of tester that are uh, looking at uh, what is the problem with your system. And uh, if your system is going to be used in a hospital environment to make an activity like this, uh, especially if you are doing with many hospitals, could be quite highly uh, useful because uh, you will have, uh, um, you will anticipate a potential problem, otherwise you will have to go into the market. I will finish here, so we'll let some uh, time for q and I hope that uh, starting from a generic problem, uh, being through some legislation and some uh, uh, consideration, and then uh, going to some uh, technical example could uh, help you to have an idea of how complex and big uh, and uh, unfortunately um, uh, critical is this environment for everything we're doing. Um, so thank you for, for your attention. Thanks, Luca, for your presentation. I wanted to ask uh, the audience if there are any questions in relation to what uh, you have presented to us. Yeah, Luca, this is Jerome speaking. I don't. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great presentation. And I think it's a very nice look towards the future, maybe not for you, but for projects uh, like ours that try to connect data, applications, etc. Of course, we, we're doing that at the research level. So I don't think that it has uh, enough value to be attacked uh, from outside right now. But uh, we aim then to pave the future uh, towards staff that are much more connected. And uh, in terms of stratification, understanding better, um, just think better is the health of the patients in an integrated way. So maybe um, if this comes accessible for specific persons who are influent, for example, in the world and might be subject to attacks. Uh, so all this cyber security becomes extremely, extremely relevant. So I'm really grateful that you're putting that forward because this, this is really a look towards the future and and people will have to worry a lot about this. Uh, and it's particularly with the internet of things, as you have uh, pointed out. Um, the, my question is, as is a curiosity, it's, it seems to me sometimes that uh, we're, a bit, um, we're, a bit, we're a bit getting uh, backwards in terms of security. And um, I'm referring to uh, the, the mobile phone industry. So now when you want to contract a product, uh, you just have to go uh, through a phone call. And the identification of the individual is extremely sloppy, at least in Spain. They will ask you your ID number, 
There is no security code. There's absolutely nothing. And just with the ID number talking to a person, uh, even if it's even if you're not uh, calling from your own phone, you can modify the services. And and then of course it, it puts a lot of a lot of concern. Uh, if you can imagine that no through your phone, you will be able to uh, I don't know uh, control uh, insulin uh, insulin raise. Um, insulin release uh, for your diet for a diabetic uh, a pacemaker or whatever other thing no uh, and, and right now for example you can control your your um, your online banking and and you need your mobile phone with all security codes for online banking and there are already uh, cases of uh, mobile phone hacking in order to target actually the bank accounts so I don't know if you have a specific view about that, or if there are specific um, regulations that are being put in place to force uh, the mobile phone service providers to improve security, because I think it's really critical now, at least in some countries. Well, uh, th there are, well, uh, in my past experience, I worked with uh, uh, the, the specific uh, industry of, of, of telco. So I work with uh, Vodafone, and then with some other telco, etc. in terms of provider. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, it's not only related to the mobile. Uh, the problem is that we need to consider that the digitalization is creating uh, more efficiency, a lot of more efficiency in front of uh, previous uh, solution. But uh, we are not paying enough attention to the fact that uh, we can have a 100% saving, but the saving need to be 80% because 20% need to go into something that uh, is not only technology, but is also behavior linked to, to this. So uh, now we are able to, to pick up a phone and to make a video call with the US uh, in, in in uh, half a second with a, a very great video with no cost, okay? But we need to consider that aspect a lot because uh, with this uh, potential, there is also a significant responsibility in terms of uh, knowing how to use the tool. Because if we need this tool, instead of making you a call to, uh, to someone uh, because you want that. You install a software on your smartphone because uh, it's an app that you can find somewhere. And this app uh, is able to pick up uh, your microphone and video and to, to share it with someone else. Then that become uh, a significant problem. So it becomes a matter of culture on how to use these tools. Because otherwise uh, the benefit that you have is really uh, not uh, um, entirely uh, valuable if you are generating potential big problem to the privacy, to the operation of, of uh, uh, people, uh, to safety uh, of people and, and so on. So it's, um, it's a matter of uh, um, training to these digital tools that we are just at the beginning um, and, and uh, there is very, very few people that have enough sensibility on that. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a question in the chat by Esteban and there is uh, regarding if you think uh, that you, uh, with new technologies uh, like blockchain, we can uh, avoid uh, some of these uh, issues. Well, of some, yes, not all of them. And then you will have problem on the blockchain part. So the, this will be a never ending story. Um, there is not a case that uh, uh, the virus on the computer has that name. Unfortunately, from, from, from the healthcare point of view, we have, once we solve the problem, then we have another one and so on, so on, so on. And this is uh, the same situation in the um, cybersecurity field. You could solve something, but then you will have a problem of other kind 
and they were from other kind of source. So the 100% uh, uh, safe uh, from a cyber security point of view is uh, an utopia, unfortunately, because it's 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 done by human. As human make errors, then you will have the error there. Or you will find something that will overcome the the previous situation. For example, uh, the uh, quantum computer are said to be uh, a completely game changer in all the uh, cryptography world because cryptography based its own uh, logic on the fact that now with actual system it could take uh, I don't know one thousand years to to break the code. But with the quantum, if the, with the quantum computer, it takes uh, 30 seconds, then everything that now we have encrypted become uh, clear because it will take 30 seconds. And it's not a matter of error in that case, but it's a matter of obsolescence in front of new technologies. Luckily, quantum computers are still crappy. <laughs> yeah, luckily. Yeah, and uh, I had another question. So this morning, uh, Jose Plus presented so uh, all the integrated, um, all the integrated tools that we have for uh, data management and uh, computing workflows uh, in the domain of, of health molecular biology. And I know that as part, for example, of the um, uh, European Open Science Initiative, so uh, the are specific pilots for security. For data security, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of these pilots. If you're following up on that, but um, as far as I could see, as more um, they're more focused on identification. Uh, I don't know if they're already focused to end-to-end uh, -end encryptation of data, etc. So, so. Is it uh, actually a, a first point of security that uh, then might lead to a sustainable and development of security increase uh, along the development so of all these uh, of all these networks of data communication in health, or uh, is it a very first basic level of security and uh, everything will have to be completely rethought? Uh, along with the growth of uh, database health uh, services and, and, and controls, for example, of medical devices? Well, um, the, the problem is that uh, uh, this kind of initiative are one step that do not solve the entire uh, problem. I'm not able to solve the entire problem because uh, it's at the moment too complex and too dynamic. So. Uh, if we if we have a, a something that is able to solve an issue that is stable, then you can work on that and then solve it if you have enough time and if, if it's possible. But here, the landscape is so dynamic, it's changing so much that uh, it's really hard to uh, have an initiative that is able to solve uh, the entire uh, kind of problem that you could have. Maybe you could solve one, but then you have a new one and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've started to work in cybersecurity in 2000, but until today, I haven't seen a decrease of problem. I can see an increase of problem. First of all, because the number of users of these tools become from some hundreds of millions, that was at the beginning of the internet, to billions that are now, and now everyone is on the internet. But then you start to have uh, problem uh, that are uh, of different uh, level. So for example, you would have application that uh, could be, that could in the future to attack a person to harm uh, physically, like uh, for example, creating uh, strong sound in a moment or to make some uh, images in the screen that uh, create to someone that uh, suffer uh, by some, some problem to have a reaction. So it's, it's I mean, uh, the, the imagination could be so significant that uh, uh, the, the, the number of attack uh, will change in the future to the point that it's not able to anticipate all of them. So 
I think that the only answer is to reduce and to protect as much as possible, but you really cannot um, solve all the problems. Okay, thanks. It, it's about impossible. It's about impossible to solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so um, after any uh, any last questions uh, for Luca? I don't know, Andrea, if there are questions, remaining questions to the chat. No, no, no. Luca answered the, the questions. So that's great because we're on time. <laughs> <laughs>